Okay, so my name is Plato. I am known to the world as Plato. Um, this is my Greek outfit, right? Toga. And um, I lived about 2,500 years ago, but I ended up teaching at a school called the Academy and I wrote some dialogues. And so um, young people who go to college like the Academy still read my dialogues after 2,500 years. And people talk about me in many, many different ways. They say all sorts of crazy things, but I'm here to tell you the story of why I started the Academy and what I wanted future students to learn and future teachers to teach. I want people to understand what happened to me in my life because as I went through life, when I got to midlife, I realized that the story of my life is the story of human life. It's not just personal. It was about the nature of human civilization, what it means to have a well-structured civilization, or at least the beginning of a well-structured civilization. And then after the ancestors have created a good structure and made it possible to have a flourishing society, I watched while well, all of my peers, my authority figures, my friends, abused the system. They became corrupt and they destroyed it. And then the society became unstable and a very ambitious uncle of mine claimed that he was gonna bring Athens back to its wonderful traditions. And then once he got elected, he exercised absolute power. He killed off his political opponents. He ran out all the foreigners out of the country and he acted like a dictator. So basically I was born into a city state that prided itself on being a free and open society, on having citizens engaged in public life. And I, within 30 years, right, one generation, we completely lost it. So I knew that every generation that's, that is capable, that has the opportunity to read my dialogues, which encourage critical thinking, they have no respect for anybody. Everybody in those dialogues is corrupt, except Socrates, but everyone people looked up to is exposed as being corrupt. So no authoritarian society would ever allow those books to be, to be read. So everyone who has access to those books has natural intelligence, the opportunity to get an education to the point where they, they have the opportunity to read the dialogues. And, um, and they live in a, in a free and open situation, right? So they have natural ability, educational opportunity, and intellectual freedom. So my message is to them, if you have this, if you have the privilege to read my dialogues, what I'm telling you is this is how we destroyed it. If you want to destroy what you have, if you want to pass on to your children and grandchildren a corrupt, authoritarian, or completely collapsed democracy, go ahead, do what we did. And I have dialogue after dialogue. Here's how we corrupted the economic system. 
Here's how he corrupted the arts. Here's how he corrupted medicine. Here's how he corrupted the military. Here's how he corrupted the political system. Here's how he corrupted the courts. Right? On and on. So if you want to destroy democracy, here, this is the way to do it. Which, of course, hopefully, people don't want to do that. They don't want their society to collapse. They don't want to pass on something much worse to their children. And so they will not do these things that my dialogues are about. But before I can tell you, you know, about the rise and fall of what I consider a great society, you have to think about, well, what do you think a great society is? What is a great society? And what is corruption? I'm not sure people who live in a free and open society even know what they value about it. They, I mean, some of them just value it because it's my society and I'm being patriotic. Well, the same people would be just as loyal to an authoritarian society. So the only reason it's great is because I happen to be a citizen here. That's not, that's not rational, right? I, I don't want to be blindly patriotic. I think I just was lucky and I happened to grow up in a city state in a society that was incredibly advanced. It was my luck, but I watched it destroy itself. And so I wanna tell the story of why I thought Athens was well-structured and tried to promote the well-being and the development of higher order activities, intellectual, political, cultural, in as many people as possible over time as any other society we ever heard of. The society was structured to help people become fully human, to develop their capabilities. And then we destroyed it. So I think there is a natural foundation for why Athens was better than any other society we knew of. But that just makes it more horrible that the Athenians destroyed it. So let me start out by talking about my uncle Solon, who was credited with writing the constitution of Athens. He was fed up with the way that the Greek city-states would develop into this huge gap between the rich and the poor, no middle class. Then there would be these civil wars. So the rich would oppress the poor as much as they could. Then the poor would finally rebel and there'd be a civil war. Then they'd kill off everybody that had leadership capacities. So they'd gain power, but they had no leaders. So then the, the aristocrats, the rich and the privileged would gain power again and just be this horrible cycle of unnecessary destruction and suffering. So my uncle Solon wrote a constitution that was designed to get the rich and the poor to weave them together so you'd have a middle class. And so it would be stable. It would be as large as possible as high a standard living as possible at a certain time in the history of the city. Um, and it would have the largest possible middle class as stable as possible over time. So human affairs are very imprecise, but I thought of my uncle Solon as a political genius because he was way ahead of his time for developing a constitution that promoted human capabilities. Um, so let me explain all the aspects of a society that tries to cultivate a middle class 
and humanity, to cultivate our humanity. Um, first of all, you have to create laws and institutions, right? You have to create laws, you have to create uh, legislative bodies that make the laws, you have to create judicial bodies that apply the laws to particular cases, you have to create an executive uh, institution to execute the decisions made by the juries or the judges. And um, you have to do it in a way that constantly promotes the middle class and the engagement of as many citizens as possible in the process. Um, and you have to promote moderation. You have to encourage people to want to be middle class and not above middle class, just middle class, so that they are at an equal level economically, they will have more empathy with each other. They will support each other. They will trust each other. They will have goodwill for each other. If people take pleasure in being middle-class, if some people are wealthier for certain reasons, they can give their money away. They can be generous in a way that promotes human development and a middle class. Um, the, okay, so then a major factor in that has to be the educational system. So the educational system has to be designed to uh, encourage people to want to be moderate in their their physical standard of living, but want to pursue their talents, want to develop their intellectual capacities, the appreciation of the arts, opportunities for engagement in artistic creativity, um, and then citizen engagement in public life. So what Solon did when you hear about democracy, is that if you were Greek male with a certain amount of property, which nowadays is not inclusive enough, but I like speaking for Plato, of course, of course we would include eventually, I knew eventually women would be included, non-Greeks would be included, slavery would, would end. That was, I could project that into the future, but at the time, this was extremely progressive and there were way more people participating at way higher levels of citizen engagement than anybody else. So um, you had to be Greek male and have some property. Your name was put into a hopper and chosen absolutely by lot, by chance, right? Nobody gets to bribe the choosers. <laughs> um, and then you are put on a jury for jury trials, or you are put on the assembly. And there's only one, a unicameral assembly. There's not like in the US where they have a Senate and a House of Representatives. There's only one assembly. And they vote on issues of public policy. So. You have random citizens making the decisions. The majority vote is what the city does. So, um, and then there's an informal uh, system of education. So there's the formal situ situation, the formal system of education and the informal one. So I want to describe to you using some, uh, using pictures of Athens what it was that I thought was so great about my city state. So here is the Athens, the way it was laid out. So wherever you were in the city, you could see the Acropolis, which is the hill. And at the top of it is the temple to Athena. Athena is the goddess of wisdom, justice, and war. And we all knew the stories of Athena and Zeus 
all the myths, all the uh, 12 Olympian gods. This was common, common knowledge. We lived in a culture that was mostly oral, an oral tradition. So people told stories and they, the, and people in an oral tradition tend to have really good memories too, because they, they can't just say, oh, I'll read that later. Or I don't have to remember that because I can just put it on a Google drive, right? You have to remember if you, if you care about something, you have to remember it. And so uh, we all knew these stories. And um, so the shadow of the lover of wisdom and justice uh, showed, was um, cast over the city, always reminding people, right? The goal of this city is wisdom, justice, um, and truth. So Athena was the god of war. Well, first of all, she was her... Her father was Zeus, the god of justice. But in the stories, he loses his temper. He has affairs with women. He cheats on his wife and he rapes women and he does all this stupid stuff. And Athena tells him, you know, settle down. Don't do, she's wiser than he is. And she's... Um, she is also a weaver of cloth. So when she's out in the public realm, she, she weaves people together to try and create a just society. And then when she's at home, she weaves cloth. And then she gives that to people to fill, fulfill their physical needs. So Athena is uh, a great character, a great goddess. Um, and she has a little half brother named Ares, and he is the god of war. And Ares is violent. He has a double-edged sword, so he kills people on both sides. He really doesn't care. So in the Iliad, he goes out there just to show how macho he is, and he starts killing people. And Zeus condemns him, Athena condemns him, and his mother, Hera, the goddess of honor, also condemns him. So the message is that you should not honor uh, bravery in war when it really becomes brutality. You only honor soldiers who are fighting in a just war, and they're fighting uh, in a way that doesn't commit more violence than is necessary. So Athena is the one that has to keep a lid on wars and prevent them from becoming too violent and brutal. Um, so let's see. So let me go to the next slide. Nope. Uh, <laughs> The next slide is different than the next. Okay, so here's the temple to Athena. Now, how you get up there is very different from a medieval cathedral. So it's important for you to know that the architecture represents a worldview. It's <laughs> every aspect of this site is carefully thought out by people who want you to think in a certain way. So in the Middle Ages, um, people wanted you to think about eternal life. They wanted you to focus on believing in God and this world is nasty and horrible, but if you just avoid committing sins, you can go to heaven. So in the Middle Ages, you have cathedrals built right on the ground, right in the middle of the dirty, horrible, world, noisy, dirty, poverty, all these problems, and you step into that cathedral, and it's designed like a rocket ship to heaven, okay? It's designed to be as high as possible, and the light comes in from the top, and the music is very otherworldly, and everything about it is a different world. This is not the Greeks 
Okay, the Greeks did not want that. The Greek view is that the gods gave us these powers. Athena, uh, the goddess of justice, they want us to exercise these powers. These are sacred powers. We're not, um, we're not being arrogant. We're not taking the place of the gods by deliberating about justice and trying to act justly. We're actually doing what they want us to do. If we don't try to cultivate a flourishing humanity, we are defying the will of the gods, right? The gods can't tell us what to do, but they give us the powers of soul to be able to govern ourselves and take care of ourselves. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Um, so when uh, so the way it's built is that the steps are very shallow and and uh, they, you don't have to step up very much and then you step over. So there's just this slow process of walking up the hill because you want to integrate yourself as a physical being, as a emotional being, and then as a spiritual being. And as somebody who's capable of, of um, dedicating yourself to the love of justice, to wanting to set up a society where people take turns ruling and being ruled and treat each other as fellow citizens living under a body of laws and obedience to the law rather than the power of any one individual person. Um, okay, so the other point here is that the, the temples were built to look like they're proportionate because it, we have a natural response, positive response to order and proportionality. Why? Because our evolutionary history, every time we found, discovered some pattern in the world, we were better adapted. It was, a it was our way of surviving. So just understanding order, symmetry, uh, is, is a natural positive response. So actually these columns are built so that they are actually out of proportion, but um, for the sake, so that when people look at them, they look like they're proportionate. Um, so I guess, I guess I haven't figured out how to get the students to be able to see the slides, but um, I'll show them in class tomorrow. Then at the top of the Parthenon is also a court of law. So here you have the temple to Athena, and then you have the court of law where human beings are engaging in the process of treating each other just, justly and making decisions about how to punish a wrongdoer in a way that maintains a strong middle class. So the courts, this is your sacred duty to be a good juror. On the side of the hill of the Parthenon is a, is a theater because we had tragedies, right? We, um, everybody knows the Greeks uh, were into performances and tragic performances. Well, when you're walking up to the temple, halfway up the temple, you get to the theater. The theater is the place where you flush out irrational emotions so that you're, you can go up and become a good citizen. Before you can engage in citizenship, you have to acknowledge that you're capable of some pretty irrational emotions. And so the purpose of the theater is to take some of people, some people's irrational fantasies and show a story of somebody who lives out that fantasy and it comes to a bad end. Everybody gets hurt. And so when you're watching it, you go, oh, 
I don't want to do that. Um, I guess taking revenge isn't the thing I really want to do. Um, so all those stories about Zeus raping women and crippling them and having these crippled children, um, they're not designed to reinforce that or to say, you know, powerful men just are this way. What they're saying is powerful men will be tempted to do this, to cheat on their wives, to go after young and sweet, you know, <laughs> sweet young things to you know, force sex upon women, to sow their seed, to have all sorts of kids with all sorts of women. But it's a disaster. It creates all sorts of dysfunction. And so the, the stories are trying to get you not to do that. Flush it out, purge yourself of that. So the word purgation was a medical word. So if people were physically sick, They'd go to the doctor, the doctor would give them something to drink, and they would throw up and have diarrhea and purge themselves of whatever poison there was in their body, right? In the theater, you go there and you watch people uh, living out all these toxic behaviors and toxic emotions right? You get this, just like drinking this horrible uh, potion, right? So you drink this emotional potion and you go, oh, <laughs> I don't think I want to do that. So you clear yourself of irrational emotions and the false opinions that went with them. And then you go up to the temple and then you try to remove obstacles, intellectual obstacles, right? Uh, habits of thought or ideas that are blocking your ability to actually see the truth and to actually act justly. So there's this purgation of all the obstacles so that you can be fully human. A fully human pe person really can understand how to exercise power and take turns ruling and being ruled. It's a higher level of human interaction. It's what civilization really is. Um, then we had the Olympics. You all know about the Olympics um, and the philosophy behind that. Most people don't know. It was a sacred hol uh, holiday. It was the, uh, the torch bearer ran through the city-states, and while he was running through in that area, there was a truce, you know, no wars. And so the underlying point of the Olympics was that this was a way to get people to promote peace rather than war. So it was related to the Greek uh, desire to teach people how to be just and how to, about citizenship. So the Olympics started, you know, way before Athens sort of became the city-state that it was. The Olympics started in 800 BC. Well, it started before that with just women, but I don't want to go into that. Um, so there were a number of different Greek deities who were exercising their powers, or people were supposed to be inspired by these deities. So the Olympic Games are a lot like a democracy. These different city-states come together and form a common body of laws, which is exactly what happens within a city-state. The citizens come together and agree on a common body of laws. So that's what happened in the Olympics. The leaders of each city-state came together. They formed a body of laws. And there were many, many ways that the situation was set up to get as much citizen engagement as possible, as broad uh, representation. So the people locally, the people who lived in Olympia actually took care of the site and they managed all the technical stuff that happens when you have all these athletes coming in and their coaches and the audience and everybody. So. Um, so the local people 
took to, you know, engaged in management activities. It wasn't top down. Um, and the, the judges were like, there were priests there to make sure that the gods were honored in the way that the Olympics was conducted. And uh, specifically Zeus, the God of justice, that the laws were um, well-written and then Apollo, the God of reason, so that uh, people applied the law as well. And um, the, there were many, many ways that the capacities of Apollo were being put to use. Um, first of all, in the, in the um, it was rational. You have to be objective and detached, right, as you're, you can't, the judges, the juries, um, you can't favor somebody from your city state. You have to be objective. You have to think like a citizen, a Greek, not just a Greek from Athens or from Sparta. You have to think like these laws apply to everybody apart from what city state they come to from, also apart from class. Within each city state, uh, there were tryouts and you could be in the lower class and qualify, right? As long as you were the best. Um, people with money tended to have more time to get trained. But if there was a talented person out there in the countryside, uh, they would, if they qualified, then they would get the training and they would go to the Olympics. Um, Hera, there was a big um, um, tower to honor Hera because she's the goddess of honor. And so being physically fit, having a sound mind in a sound body is something you honor among citizens, but you can't make it uh, illegal to be fat, right? <laughs> You don't want to have the laws forcing people, you know, and what, exactly what they eat and their exercise. But it's something that's honorable when people keep physically fit. And the city depends on people to keep themselves physically fit. You have a duty as a citizen because everybody suffers. If you get sick too much, it costs the city. Um, all right. So... Um, anyway, there were a number of other deities honored at the Olympics, but those were the main ones. Um, then there was that um, in the shadow of the Acropolis, there was also the marketplace, okay? And there were two marketplaces. There was the one where people came to buy their material goods. And so on the market day, people would come from the rural areas and from the city. They'd buy their stuff. But then right next to that, this is a major um, gathering place for citizens to talk about public affairs. And so the city provided all this space to um, to to. Uh, just constantly tell people, we want you to be engaged. We want you to be um, informed as a citizen. And we want you to be talking to each other so that you can cultivate your practical wisdom. So the, in the assembly, there was a council who decided which issues that came before the assembly, what order they would be considered in, that when people wanted to take some issue to the assembly, they had to go through the council. So the building where the council met was right there in the marketplace. And there was, it was the media center. There was posted what issues were going to come up in the assembly at that time. Then there were, when, when people were randomly picked, to be on juries, the people from rural areas had to have a place to stay when they came into the city. 
And the apartments where they stayed were right there in the marketplace. And then right next to them was posted what, what criminal trials were being um, held at that time. So what that meant was all the citizens had this opportunity and responsibility to be informed. Then there was a space. Um, there were three small temples to Athena, Zeus, and Ares, the goddess of wisdom and justice, justice and, and war, because deciding about war was one of the major issues that the assembly had to vote on. So you better be careful how you make those decisions. Uh, you can kill, you know, you can self-destruct, you can ruin your city if you're not careful. And then after you walk past those small temples reminding you, then you, there's this huge open space. This is where you're supposed to go and talk. You're supposed to inform each other about what's going on. And so if you come to the marketplace regularly, you know what's, you know the history, what the assembly's been doing, what they decided on. Um, and it, <laughs> it's okay. Speaking as Plato, I thought it was absolutely incredible, right? The way that the people who came before us had set all this up. And we also had another tradition in our houses where we could, instead of just having a random dinner party, we would have a symposia. And that meant that if you come to my house for dinner, we're going to talk about some serious question. And the, the host might have told them before what that question would be like what is justice or what is beauty or what do you think about this particular law or what do you think about this particular leader? But you're going to have a symposia and everybody is going to have to talk, right? So it's this constant talking about public affairs, talking about serious things, learning how to think at a higher level, how to make your decisions at a higher level, uh, how to keep focused on your responsibilities as a citizen in a democratic society. So we had that tradition of symposia. Um, and then let's see, we had, um, we had the Greek islands and off on the islands, we had a number of um, speculative thinkers, all right? So we had people who figured out, they rejected the notion that the gods were the causes of natural events. And they were speculating about well, what are the ultimate causes of natural events? How does the universe work, right? What are the principles of reality? And so there were enough num number of different schools of thought. And so one of them, said um, that earth, air, fire, and water, that everything is, uh, exists in a cycle. So everything we see comes to be out of these four basic elements, and then it goes back into the basic elements and it comes. So it's a self-sustaining. So that's the recycling guy, right? And then there was Heraclitus who said, uh, the only thing that doesn't change is the law of change. And so he, he thought that everything is always changing and um, you never step in the same river twice. And his ultimate principle was fire, which now you would say energy, right? So energy, things are, the ultimate cause of things is energy and things are constantly changing, they're transient. Then Democritus said that the nature of everything is made up of atoms. And the word atom just means the smallest thing. And they're shaped differently. And that's why things look different because the atoms come together and come apart. So, um, so there are a number of uh, physicists 
and uh, speculative thinkers even today in your country that would say, oh, I'm a Democritean, um, somebody who's looking for the smallest particle, right? The quarks, the alpha particles, the beta particles, and they're finding, trying to find the smallest one that everything else is made up of. Those are the ones following in Democritus tradition. Um, there, are, uh, there was a, a physicist named um, Heisenberg and he identified with uh, Heraclitus. Then of course, the ecologists, the environmentalists will identify with Empedocles. And there's just a number of them. Um, and so, so that was just that certain way of thinking. The main premise is that human beings by nature desire to understand the universe because it's actually understandable. There are patterns under there. There are universal principles or there are uniform, some reality has some kind of a uniformity so that we can actually understand it. So we can understand the universe in its basic foundations. We can understand human affairs and we can understand these patterns of good and evil. We can understand patterns of irrational emotions that lead to unnecessary corruption. And we can also understand that we, we all have capacities for higher order thinking. We can all think like citizens. We can all engage in artistic creativity, scientific inquiry, and the best society would be set up to give people opportunity and responsibility. So that's why I thought, you know, my city state was truly on a natural foundation, the best one anybody had ever known. Um, I, we also had our science and our medicine was really advanced. And there was a, a center for just women's health at an island, the first island off of the port. So women would go there for particular issues related to women's health. And then there was another center at Epidaurus for um, people who, who, you know, nobody in their city state, no doctor knew what to do with them. So they came to Epidaurus and um, there were many different kinds of therapies there. And the interesting thing about it is they start out going into a sweat lodge and they ingest certain herbs that actually give them dreams, which still are true. You know, it's found out that that was legit. And what they dreamed was some message from the gods about, you know, their sickness or what to do. And then after that, they went and got the, the drugs and the suggestions from the physicians. And then there was a theater there because maybe your physical health is related to your emotional uh, sickness. So you have to flush out emotional poisons. And then there was an Olympic track. So you have to stay fit. So there's always this in integration of physical health, emotional health, intellectual health. So health was thought of in a very holistic way, in a very religious way, right? These are sacred. It's a sacred duty to stay healthy. It's a sacred duty to take our knowledge and educate people about how they can stay healthy. Um, all right, so, so we loved to go to, onto the islands. People also like, like to go there just to talk. So our way of life was very much connected to dialogue. You, the way you learn how to be just isn't just to have individual experiences and draw a conclusion, jump to a conclusion. You have, if you have an experience, you have to think, is that a pattern? Is that something that happens all the time because of the human condition or because there's a certain kind of corruption in Athens? Or is it just an idiosyncratic and accidental event? 
Um, so the only way to figure all that stuff out is to keep talking to people. Um, all right, so we also had the site of F of Delphi and all sorts of stuff, but now I have to tell you about how the society got corrupted. And the point is every part of our society was corrupted and that's how we lost our democracy. So what happened? Well, well, we fought a war against the Persians. The Persians were right now who we would call the Iranians. <laughs> so some things never change. Um, anyway, and so the Persians had a one demigod that everybody worshiped. So nobody was engaged in political life at all. Everybody was just a servant and stupid and could had no access to information, had no idea what that ruler was doing, but he was God and you obeyed him. That was it. So the Greeks thought that when they're fighting against the Persians, it's not just a power struggle. It's about civilization. It's about humanity. <laughs> and they were outnumbered eight to one, right? But the Persians landed and they just flooded the, the beaches, right? But the Greeks retreated and they retreated up through the mountain pass. So the Persians walked right into those mountain pass and then the Greeks surrounded them and starved them out, right? <laughs> and, you know, killed them off and starved them out. So they, they could, you know, kill way more than, than were killed. And then they, um, they, there was a bay that had, was kind of small on both two ends. And so the Persian ships all got into that bay and then the little Greek ships <laughs> just held out over on the two um, outlets and just starved them out again, right? And so the Greeks were strategic. Uh, just like those good old revolutionary war guys, when the British landed and they're in their red coats and they're rich and they're going to go get them. And the revolutionary, you know, our heroes hid behind the rocks and the trees, right? <laughs> and sort of shot them down. Yeah, I think there's a lot of similarities there. Um, so the Persians thought of the Greeks as these sort of barbaric, aggressive, assertive, uh, disrespectful, <laughs> um, uncivilized. And of course the Greeks thought of the Persians as just blind obedience, unity at any cost, lower level of thinking, lower level of living. So they're, they both think they're fighting for civilization, right? And so when the Greeks won, they thought the gods, right? The gods were on their side and it was an affirmation of their way of life and their, their way of promoting citizen engagement in public life. But while they were fighting the Persians, there were two city-states that became the most powerful. And it was Athens on the one hand and the other one was Sparta. Sparta was a military state. So every, all the institutions were structured toward valuing and rewarding people who fight courageously in war. So the, all the boys at age seven are sent to military school and they learn blind obedience to their city state, right? And the most honorable thing you can do is fight bravely in war. So if you're good at that, then you get promoted to a general. And if you're successful at that, then you get put on the council and you get to be a political leader. So that's what's honored, okay? They didn't have any, nobody was allowed to leave, to emigrate, and nobody was allowed to immigrate. It's just Spartans, okay? Whereas in Athens, they had in the marketplace, they traded with everybody around the world and, and they invited all these foreigners in 
And they were the free and open society. They were the cosmopolitan society. Everybody prided themselves on being multicultural and, and open to different ideas and all this wonderful stuff. So these two city states, each of them thinks the other one is a barbarian, right? The Athenians think the Spartans are, oh my God, blind obedience. Nobody gets to talk back, you know, forget it. There's no arts, no culture, no tragedy, no comedy, no, uh, no nothing, nothing that's fun. No symposia in homes. All right, these are barbarians. And the Spartans thought the Athenians, they're just a bunch of drinking, sexing, no respect for the gods, no respect for their country. Um, they're just always questioning everything. They're so rebellious. They're so self-indulgent. So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna beat them. So all the other city states, they didn't want to get involved, right? You guys go kill each other. You know, just leave us out of it. But that's not what they did, of course. They created these power blocks and they said they'd go to a city state. Either you're going to join our league, the Delian League, uh, uh, the two leagues, or we're going to conquer you because the Athenians would say, if, if you don't come with us willingly, then we need, we're gonna force it because otherwise the Spartans will get you on their side in their league or they'll think we're too weak and they'll go after us right in Athens, right? So we have to prove to the Spartans that we're more powerful than them. So there was one city, uh, island, Mel Melos, that was sort of strategically placed and so the Malians knew that the Spartans and Athenians might come, like one or the other, or both, and want to take them. And they didn't want, they wanted to be left alone. So whichever comes, they told their, their leaders, their political leaders, to go tell whoever comes to get out. Well, the Athenians arrived. And the uh, story of the Peloponnesian War uh, Thucydides tells it that the Athenians said, look, guys, you know, you come or we'll force, force you to come. And the Malians courageously spoke back, but the Athenians <laughs> killed, killed or imprisoned all their uh, physically able men and um, sowed I mean, just completely decimated the place, completely. So, so needless to say, there were young people in Athens that would hear these stories about the way the soldiers were treating the people in the other city-states. So the friends in the other city-states were being heavily taxed and to the point where none of those city states could have a democratic society. They couldn't have a middle class. They're just working for Athens and power and wealth. Um, and then their enemies, when they conquered a place, they would bring the spoils of war back and again, accumulate more money. And you should never do that, right? You shouldn't have an ulterior motive for going to war, which is collecting the spoils. What you should do is, is save the spoils, right? Or use it to bribe other people to get at your enemies so you don't have to have a war. But that's not what Athens did. So when Athens was establishing their league, they, they had a, a role model to follow. It was the Persians. So they were acting just like the Persians. They were imitating the Persians. And so this Athens was becoming more and more imperialistic, more and more interested in power and money than in democracy. So some of the young people were questioning it and they would have these anti-war demonstrations. And um, 
so the political situation was getting very polarized and um, the society was starting to destabilize. And so what happened was, um, for example, the Parthenon, right? This wonderful temple to Athena and all these, the temple to Hephaestus, all this beautiful layout, the theater. Well, where did the money come from to pay for all that stuff, right? The public works. <laughs> well, it was from taxing your friends and the spoils of your enemies, right? It was through their imperialism, their domination of the rest of the Greeks that they were actually able to pay for all this stuff that was a tribute to democracy, right? Freedom and equality and everybody, this is true for everybody. Well, if it's true for everybody, the people in these other city states ought to have some freedom and some equality. You know, you shouldn't treat them like your slaves, right? Second class citizens. So that's how, you know, the whole public works thing got corrupted, is the building and the maintenance of those public monuments. Um, and then how did the, how did the courts, well, how did the theater get corrupted? People started not thinking of it as a purgation. This is what you're not supposed to do. <laughs> they would start thinking of, oh yeah, Zeus. Good, go for it, guy. I think I'll try that out. You know, they either misinterpreted it and decided that the gods can get bribed. And if you get rich enough, you can pay off, right? Right toward the end of your life. You can do anything you want in life, but right toward the end, if you confess and you give money to the religious leaders to run the temples, then you'll go to the right part of Hades and it will all work out, right? So, so you can actually bribe the gods at the end um, by paying to the religious leaders in the church. Um, and then they thought, so the tragedies were, they, they didn't get that it was a purgation. This is what not to do. They started to get that, oh yeah, that's a pretty good idea. And, um, the real education went on, not during the tragedy so much. Um, the citizens came in for a religious holiday. There were th three tragedians who each wrote uh, a four part, four different plays. Everybody watched these 12 plays. Some of the citizens were chosen at random to vote on which one they liked best. So the way the institution is set up is that you're, it's your sacred duty to learn these lessons. And we want the citizens to decide, arbitrary, chosen by lot, so, because we want everybody to think about this stuff. And so after the performance, they would go to the taverna, right? Have an ouzo, it's a kind of liqueur that tastes like licorice. And they would drink and talk. They would talk about the tragedy. And what happened is that those conversations started to get degenerate. And instead of learning the lesson, they were actually unlearning the lessons. Um, for example, Agamemnon is a real jerk in a lot of these plays. But uh, somebody could easily have gone to the taverna and go, oh, I love that Agamemnon. You know, he really knows who's boss. And somebody else would say, he's not democratic. <laughs> he's, I mean, no, he can't have a democracy. He, all he cares about is power. And he was like, no, no, I really like that guy. So you start to understand that your fellow citizens really aren't committed to democracy and they aren't they aren't willing to engage in the kind of conversations that the tragedies wanted you to engage in, which is every character has a good argument, but all but one of them is gonna do the wrong thing. So you learn that life is complicated and you learn that it's ambiguous, decisions aren't clear, but the plays always show you that one person in the end has the better judgment. And so you can, through talking it through, 
you can understand how complex things are, but you can still understand some ways of life are better, some decisions are better, and the playwright is making that clear, but they're not oversimplifying it, and they're not preaching to you. They're not saying, naughty, naughty, don't you do that. They're saying, look, here's what happens if you do that. And there are lots of good reasons for doing really stupid things. <laughs> don't do it and don't justify it with these reasons. Um, so that's where you really can get the education is when you're talking about it in the, in the taverna. And that's when the conversation started to get corrupt and people started to use the system to promote a, a power the pursuit of power, the pursuit of wealth, to undermine all the lessons. Um, so the theater got corrupted. The Olympics got corrupted because in the city states, every four, there were four different city states and they would have an Olympics, but the Olympia was the big one. And that was every four years. But instead of promoting overall wellness, right? The whole premise is a sound body and a sound mind and it should be every, every citizen should stay healthy. It's part of contributing to the society. But instead of doing that, the city states would keep the money. They wouldn't give it to wellness programs. They accumulate money, donations, and they'd have this huge party, right? So the... So while the athletes were doing their thing, everybody else is partying like crazy and everybody but the athletes is sort of a couch potato, uh, you know, is completely self-indulgent. They overeat, they overdrink, they don't exercise. And then the athletes themselves started getting way over-specialized, right? Each athlete had one sport, you know, it's not holistic health. It's very specific to the point where they weren't even that healthy because if they got out of their regimen, they would get sick. And every athlete was, is way over-professionalized. It wasn't the amateur sound mind and the sound body. It was very professionalized. So the, um, each athlete would have, they'd have a coach that would come and check out uh, for this athlete in this sport, they should be doing one hour of this kind of exercise and one hour of that, and then they need to do this and then they need to do that. And that would be the trainer, then they'd have a trainer that sort of guided them through, you know? And then because um, Athen uh, Greece is a dry, place it's just like a, a desert the the soil is not very rich right it's not good soil that's why they have goats and sheep and goat milk and goat cheese and sheep cheese and all that stuff um, they don't have a lot of arable land but um so the dust so the athletes always put oil on their bodies when they especially when they're wrestling of course but in general, when they're exercising. And then the dust would get kicked up and create this kind of muck. And so each athlete had a person who had this little um, half moon shaped thing that would literally wipe the stuff off of them. So each athlete came with their own little entourage of um, helpers, you know, support, support staff. And um, so basically the Olympians, the Olympics got corrupted, right? It got put into a big expensive party and it, it wasn't overall wellness for anybody. Um, and then the marketplace, okay? The marketplace, the material marketplace was supposed to be a place that promoted international trade. And so it would promote toleration. It would promote creating um, economic treaties with other city states so that you would be less likely to go to war if you have an economic bond with the other city states. 
and also toleration of different traditions. So uh, people would sell little trinkets from their society, which would show that they honored a different god, a different god or goddess than the Athenians did. Um, so a combination of getting a lot of fancy goods and high quality goods and toleration and uh, economic treaties, all that stuff was a part of the whole Athenian ethos. Well, the way it got corrupted was that the treaties started to get more unfair, right? And the Athenians were forcing the less wealthy city-states to agree to some pretty unequal uh, conditions. And then also they became moral relativists. They said, oh, everything's relative. You know, they, that city-state honors those gods and that one, those gods, it's all, it's all made up, right? It's not serious. Um, so they didn't learn any of the lessons underlying the, the myths. Um, so the original idea of the marketplace got corrupted into uh, relativism and economic domination. Uh, then the ed educational system. So the thing that bothered me the most was education because um, this idea of learning how to think dialectically, right? The way the, city, the founders set it up was to cultivate this capacity to think like a citizen and also to be creative and to know that you can explore the universe, all this stuff. And so that's what the educational system should have focused on. And also figuring out, it should have educated you in how to be a good juror, which would be, uh, what sort of facts, right, are relevant to a decision? How many facts does it take to make a decision beyond a doubt? You know, how many? So that's all learning how to, how to uh, sift through evidence to draw a conclusion, how to avoid jumping to conclusions, how to avoid um, distracted um, facts, you know, or fake <laughs> Fake news. Um, so how to assess in a court of law and also, of course, in the assembly. So the educational system should have taught you how to make judgments in the assembly. It should have given you an examples from the, uh, decisions that were made before and lessons learned, you know, was it a good decision or not? Um, but, but, the worst thing that could happen to the educational system, what is the one tool that you have to have, the one intellectual tool to gain power and wealth without virtue or justice? And that would be learning the power of persuasion, learning the power of rhetoric. So you know how to go in front of the assembly and convince people of whatever you want them to do. So you know how to manipulate emotions. You know how to distract people, right? To, to bring in false, uh, well, to bring in facts in a way that distorts the situation. I mean, there's lots of tools to use logic to corrupt people's judgments. And that's what we have, then we, the, the educational system was corrupted because foreigners came in from other city states, people who had nothing invested in, in the future of Athens. They didn't care. They just came in and they, the parents of the wealthiest aristocrats paid them a lot of money to teach their children how to speak persuasively. And so again, instead of a middle class, the upper class got the upper hand, right? So the, the sons of the wealthy got the education that enabled them to persuade the middle class and the lower class to vote for them, to agree with them, to um, follow them. So if they wanted to become political leaders, they knew how to use rhetoric to get the trust 
of the people who, you know, who would then elect them if they wanted to become lawyers, uh, defense lawyers, they could make a lot of money using these rhetorical devices to get their clients off. If they wanted, anyway, that was the tool. And that was the way the city got destroyed. It was through rhetoric, advertising, fake news, <laughs> you know, uh, social media, whatever, that was it. And, um, and so what happened was we were fighting against the Spartans and um, there was a point at which we, the Sicily had the bread basket. It was where we had to get our uh, food, but it was an unreliable source because the Sicilians, you know, had a lot of power over us. They could sell it whatever price they wanted. They knew that we needed it. And so Alcibiades, one of our generals, who was a very arrogant guy, he went in front of the assembly and he said, let's go get them, you know? Let's just conquer them. Then we know we have this food source so we don't have to sit and kiss, kiss up to them. But the old general, Nicias, who had won many battles, but who was very strategic, he said, no, we don't have enough men or ships. Like we're already fighting the Spartans over here and over here. We can't do that. We just, we don't have the resources. And then Alcibiades, who's telling us we can't do, we can do whatever we want. We're Athens, right? Yeah, okay. So <laughs> who should they have voted with? Nicias. Who did they vote with? Alcibiades. So they sent all the ships. And so they're way over, over uh, booked, right? They're going into huge debt with all their war and because they don't think there's any limit, they've become totally arrogant. Well, then they go to Sicily and they lose. And um, so that was part of it. They started, you know, that was a destabilizing influence. And then everybody who wanted to be rich would use the system to get as rich as possible. Everybody who wanted to be powerful would use the system to get as powerful as possible. And some people were just self-indulgent. They didn't want to bother developing their talent. So they had the freedom to basically do nothing. Nobody, not enough people knew the original purpose of the society, which is to cultivate uh, citizen consciousness. None of them, they didn't even know that was the point. They thought the point was freedom. Oh, freedom means the freedom to do whatever I want. I can, you know, as long as I can persuade people, I can get rich, I can get powerful, I can do nothing, as long as I can use good rhetoric. And so, of course, the system fell apart. And so, this, the Athens got more and more unstable, and pretty soon people were looking for a strong man, right? Somebody to come along and save them from themselves. And um, so um, Critias was another uncle of mine, right? Solon, my uncle, created the Constitution. Critias, my uncle, destroyed it. He said, if you vote for me, well, we lost to the Spartans. And so the Spartans demilitarized us, but we were allowed to vote for our president. Okay, so Critias, if you vote for me, I will bring us back to traditional Athenian values when people cared about family values and patriotism and the gods, the traditional gods. The reason why we lost is we were giving up our religion. We weren't patriotic. We were being self-indulgent. I will get us back to traditional values. And uh, so they voted for him. And instantly he starts killing off foreigners, all these foreigners that had made money off of Athens. He called them traitors. He tried to kill them. They ran him out of town. He tried to kill his political opponents and they all, you know, escaped. He just was a complete dictator and he lasted for nine months. And then the Democrats uh, came back. The other people in the other city states came back and eventually defeated him. But I watched that growing up, right? 
I watched us lose our democracy. So I decided I would start a school and I would tell the story and I would remind people, here's how you create a society that cultivates capabilities of people. And here's how you destroy it. And you have this now because you're reading my dialogues, but you have to take responsibility. And if you don't, you'll lose it. So that's my main message. Um, and so for today, you were supposed to read a dialogue. I had a teacher named Socrates and he's the one who went out and talked to people. And he's, my dialogues are about him talking to various people who are corrupt and their corruption shows up in their answers to his questions. So the dialogue that I asked you to read is um, about a preacher who was taking his father to court for murder. And um, that was odd. <laughs> and the reason was because a slave uh, who tended to get drunk. One of his father's slaves tended to be drunk. And um, his father, one time in a drunken fit, a, the slave killed another slave. So the, the average Greek would have just killed that slave. You know, these are, these are property. And, you know, a slave that kills your slave, you kill them. That's obvious. But Euthyphro's father wanted the gods, right? wanted the gods to make the decision. So he sent a messenger to Delphi, which is the center for where the universal justice. And uh, while that messenger was gone to find out what to do, the slave died because he had gotten just, he got his hands tied behind his back and basically thrown in a ditch waiting for the messenger to come back. And he died, okay. So Euthyphro decided to take his father to court for murder. <laughs> and his relatives are appalled because no Greek citizen would have done that. Plus, um, because it would have been considered impious because religion is about respect for your elders, especially your father, right? Respect for your parents. Honor thy father and thy mother, right? It's commandment number four. Um, so that's a very traditional religious value. And he's breaking that one big time, right? He's doing the most outrageous thing you could do to your father. And, um, but Euthyphro is convinced he's right. And um, he's just saying, and so Socrates says, well, what, you must know what the gods want, what piety is. So please tell me, <laughs> what is piety? right? You tell me, because um, Socrates was actually being accused of being impious. So, um, so, so Euthyphro comes up with a series of definitions. And so while you're reading the dialogue, what we'll talk about in class tomorrow is these different definitions. Um, and we'll just, when the class starts, I will pretend I'm Euthyphro, and I will pretend I'm Socrates, and I'll talk to the class about um, my point of view, why I think I'm right. And so Euthyphro says, piety is what I'm doing, which is not to tolerate wrongdoers, right? You got to punish wrongdoers, right? And a lot of Christians in the U.S. think that they're, they're much more punitive toward anyone committed of a crime, right? Lock them up, throw away the key, right? Death penalty, whatever. That's Euthyphro, cut and dried, black and white, no question. And then Socrates said, oh, and then he quotes from the holy book and he quotes from the creation story in uh, Hesiod, in their culture's holy book. And in that story, um, uh, Kronos, is cuts off the genitals of his father. <laughs> I'll tell you that story tomorrow. And then his son, Zeus, throws him into, into uh, Tartarus, right? So these sons are very, very nasty to their daddies. <laughs> 
And so Euthyphro is saying, look, I'm not cutting off his genitals and I'm not throwing him into the pit. You know, I'm just taking him to court. Um, and Socrates then says, oh, I didn't think those stories were intended to be taken literally. I thought they were sort of lessons about how, you know, powerful men should not uh, dominate their sons to the point where the only thing the son can do is basically cut them off so that they can have their own life, right? Uh, yeah. So Socrates read the stories not literally. Euthyphro read them literally and used them to justify taking his father to court for murder. Um, and so then Euthyphro says, piety is doing what is dear to the gods. Well, Socrates says, but they disagree, right? And in our holy books, there are 300 or something books in the Bible and they disagree. Those people don't agree with each other. And the Old Testament is different than the New Testament. And the priestly tradition is different than the prophet tradition. And they, they disagree with each other. They aren't just different. They're critical of each other. So Socrates points that out. He said, well, what all the gods, there are certain things that are cut and dried. All the gods would, would agree on is pious. Well, then Socrates says, well, um, you need to show me that in this case, all the gods would disagree, right? Because human beings don't agree. So how do you know that the gods would all agree? <laughs> and Euthyphro says, oh, well, I can tell you that, but I don't have time right now. And so then Socrates says, okay, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about is something holy because the gods love it or do the gods love it because it's holy right and that is the main question of the dialogue is something uh pious because it's in the bible or is it in the bible because it's teaching you about piety right so the trouble is the Bible contradicts itself. And the other question is, when we read Confucius Analects, we will see that Confucius is an advocate of the golden rule and Jesus is an advocate of the golden rule. Now, is it true if Jesus says it, but false if Confucius says it, if you're a Christian? So is it true just because Jesus says it? And it's not true if Confucius says it because he's not my authority. Or is did Confucius say it because it's actually true? And Jesus said it because it's actually true based on the human condition. And if the human condition is the criteria, then you can assess the parts of the Bible as better or worse based on whether on um, these other moral teachings, the teachings that keep getting passed down that are common among all the basic traditions. So that's what we want to talk about. And Euthyphro represents someone who thinks it's true because the gods love it. So they memorize the holy books and they use a quote from the holy books to justify everything they do. Doesn't necessarily mean they have a best, a good character. On the other hand, Socrates is trying to ask, well, what is holiness? How is it based on the human condition? Because then he'll be able to understand better what those stories about the gods are about. All right, then the next part of the dialogue is that piety is the part of justice that attends to the gods, whereas the other part attends to human beings. And so the question there is um, something like, if, if you know your parents have broken the law, um, should you take them to court? Should you personally take them? Or you, should you basically <laughs> report it to somebody else um, and let them do it? Or... Um, Another example is if abortion were illegal, 
first of all, if it's killing of innocent life, it should get capital punishment, according to a whole lot of people that think it should be illegal. They also accept capital punishment. Well, all right. So technically, if you suspect your teenager who with a boyfriend of having left suddenly and coming back and you think she probably got an abortion, um, would you take her to court and let her go to the electric chair? Like, truly, if you literally think it's innocent life and you think that deserves capital punishment, you think 2.2 million women in our country should get capital punishment every year, right? Well, it will cost a lot of money, that's for sure. But that's the kind of thing where you have to think it through, right? So there might be things that you think, according to your religion, are wrong, but it's pretty unworkable if you make it illegal and you, you know, give the logical punishment for it. So there's there's a number of things uh, where you might think it's, it goes against your religious beliefs and the demands of your preacher, but not your political situation and citizenship. So that's what I talked about the first day is John Locke wanted us to separate our values in the church versus when you're acting as a citizen and you're making laws. So that's what that's about. And then the art of medicine. Um, so is the art of medicine serve the doctor or does the doctor serve the art of medicine? So does the art of piety, of praying, giving to the church, serve the gods? Or um, do we engage in these um, the art of piety for the sake of the gods? Or is it for the sake of us, right? So that's another big issue. Should doctors, yeah, okay, we're going to go into that because that's about the corruption of society. And then at the end, Euthyphro just says, it's about pleasing the gods in word and deed. And then, you know, families who pray together stay together, right? If you worship the gods, then you'll be able to have good life. And um, it's kind of like a business deal. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. And it's just like, really? Uh, that seems like an ulterior motive, right? And then what happens when good people, when bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people, how do you explain that, you know? Um, so uh, I think a lot of those issues are still alive and well in the way that we debate about things. And so read through the dialogue, try to figure out what's happening in terms of things you can understand. Then I have all these news articles about, um, yeah, Bush and uh, whether Bush was a pious president, a good, good guy, and whether he ruled in a way that a pious person would rule. This one is about um, God is not a Republican or a Democrat. Um, the, and then there's articles after 9-11, there was all this disagreement because people like Jerry Falwell said, um, God allowed this to happen because our country was being taken over by the gays and the liberals and the feminists and all this stuff. So these are some articles, you don't have to read all of them, but I do think you should get some, it is important for you to know what was going on after 9-11 because there was a huge cultural shift. And there was this turning toward God, but it was a certain kind of God. It was a much more fundamentalist kind of God than our founding fathers were. And, um, and the politicians were taking advantage of the moment. So I, I do think history by now has come out with this, many, many books on this. So we have something of the hindsight is 2020 on this. But so what I, you know, I've talked for a lot more than an hour. It's an hour and a half. 
but I'd still like to have class start the class at 615 and see what you come up with. But read the youth of Bro, which is 10, 11 pages. Just scroll through those different definitions of piety, because that's what I'll talk about. Um, read some of the news articles. And I would like you to have a reaction to one or two of those articles. Um, and then we will proceed, right? Then we'll move on to the next thing. So um, it seemed like a number of you were, it seemed to me the theme that was coming out the first day was that after Black Lives Matter, you thought, well, maybe I should know more about this than I do. And, um, and you know, I, I talked a little bit about systemic racism. So this is the kind of class where you get credit for thinking about these things, right? Instead of in addition to everything else you have to do. Sort of you get college credit you get some time for taking it seriously and developing educated opinions about what's going on politically and comparing that to Athens. And Athens gave people this opportunity and they corrupted it, right? So you do have to think, do Americans abuse their freedom? Do they use it to try to develop their practical wisdom? to try and develop those qualities of a liberal mind? Or do they use it for absolutely anything but that? <laughs> and if that's true, go. Plato wrote about that 2,500 years ago. Like, didn't anybody pay attention? And it's like, maybe not. <laughs> so, you know, it's been an interesting life to teach this stuff because of course it's relevant. But it's also kind of depressing <laughs> because nobody's paying attention. But you know, it's up to you what you think. Each of you will have your own opinion. And I will see you tomorrow. And I'll forward this to you. I hope you get it. Uh, it's like almost, oh my gosh. It's almost four o'clock. Ooh, sorry. So I took a lot longer than an hour. Sorry. <laughs>